Let's get it. Let's just jump right into it, right? Why the hell not? <clears throat> Sometimes I like to pussyfoot around. Maybe we'll say that for the end. Maybe we'll just keep this a nice short episode for you guys. You know, 15, 20 minutes, I got like to do. It's my first episode after the national. Obviously, you guys uh, you saw my episode from last week. A little bit of FOMO. Would have liked to have gone. You know, couldn't, couldn't make it happen. Uh, I spent some time, you know, while I was here posting whatever folks shared with me. The good, the bad, the ugly. Um... You know, a lot of good, a lot of a lot of happy people, a lot of you know fun stuff. Um, you know, I tried to post it for the folks who were who were home but couldn't make it to the national. Hopefully, you guys, you know, you followed along with your stories and the whole deal. And um, interesting time here now because the national just ended, and we are staring down the barrel of Fanatics Fest coming up in basically three weeks. Um, and it really had me thinking after watching a lot of the content. Um, the title of the episode reminds me of the commercial, you know, that Travis Kelsey was doing, like two things at once, you know, like why can't you have both, right? So there's my 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 episode. Why can't we have both? A lot of people have talked about, you know, Fanatics Fest kind of um, you know, stepping on the toes of the national or trying to become national. Obviously, they've done a very good job of going out there and saying we're gonna be different, we're gonna be different, we're gonna be different. Let me talk about this for a second. It, you know, it's kind of what I think, right? And we'll, we'll we'll try to parse it out, right? Fanatics. There are people who love fanatics. There are people who hate fanatics. There are people in the hobby who would rather go in their time machine, you know, I like to say DeLorean, go back to before fanatics was here and try to prevent them from taking over and changing the space. Um, you know, there are some people in the hobby now who are doing really well because of fanatics. I mean, you know who they are, right? I mean, just take a look at some of the content that came out of the national and you can see who, um, the fans of fanatics are and, you know, who fanatics is a fan of in the space. I posted last week, a couple articles about fanatics that came out. One was in the post. I don't really believe a lot of that stuff. You know, a lot of people try to tell me where they smoke this fire. Eh. You know, usually when things are written, there's kind of an agenda. You know, there's going to be a slant one way or the other. So I don't really read too much into it, but it, it definitely had me thinking. And I've done episodes called, you know, the Hobby Multiverse. And these couple of weeks, I really have started to think about it in exactly that way. Because I believe the hobby is going down two tracks. I really do. And one is what you can find at the National. In its purest form, it's what you found at the National 10 years ago. It's what a lot of the newer blood, the newer breed complains about at the National. Why do we have this old, I've, I've seen, you know, I've seen um, adjectives used. Why do we have this old crusty guy with his vintage who doesn't care what he's selling? Why does he have a table at the National? He shouldn't have a table at the National. He's not even looking to sell cards. You know, why does this person have three tables with their non-graded vintage garbage that was the same thing I saw last year? Why does this blah, blah, blah? All right, let's not just put the vintage guys in one category, okay? That's national. But national is not just that, okay? National is also, I believe, more for cards and collectors of Cards that have already come out. Now stick with me here because I'm going to make what I'm going to call a bright line demarcation. Okay? You guys understand that? A bright line demarcation. We're going to split it. We're going to split it into two sides of a coin, a heads or a tails, if you will. Fanatics, for them to succeed, they need to make money. They need to make money. Now, where are they making money? The first flaw in my argument will be Fanatics collects. We'll talk about that in a second. But generally speaking, Fanatics paid the most money for tops and their licenses for the leagues. Okay, so let's just go down this path. Fanatics' biggest spend is for the tops brand and the licenses for the leagues. Okay? What value do they get out of those the biggest spend tops as a brand has legacy items in the hands of collectors tops made the 52 tops set 
And at the National, there were a whole bunch of Mickey Mantle 52 tops. There were a whole bunch of, of, of Joe Montana tops rookie and Jerry Rice tops rookie. And there was uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar tops rookies. There were all these tops rookies changing hands and money being made. Fanatics doesn't see that on their bottom line. Their purchase of tops a couple years ago, they're not getting a royalty or revenue out of all of the prior tops cards that are changing hands, trading, being collected, being bought and sold. They make their money on the tops cards that they're making now going forward. And once they've made a card and they've sold it and they've made their revenue on it, that card falls on the other end of the line, the other side of the bright line demarcation. That tops card that they made last year does not give them royalties or fees in perpetuity. That card is not something that they're going to continue. They made their money on it. They made their money on the boxes. And for them to continue generating money in the hobby, for them to continue increasing their revenue, they need to continue to sell the next thing. So nice line. That line moves with every release. Every release that happens, while it's released, while it's something they're selling, while they're making money, it's something that they are capitalizing on, something that they are pushing. But once it's in your rearview mirror, it moves over. It moves to the other side of the line. It moves to the two pads we're traveling. And fanatics will always have to cater to the new. They'll always have to cater to what's hot, what rookie class came out now, what release is coming out now, what are we printing, what are we doing, you name it. And I believe what you're seeing here is on that side of the line, that fanatic side of the line, that current and always changing current side of the line will be fanatics fest. Because for them to continue making money that way, they need to do two things. They need to continue to generate interest over and over again in whatever is new. They need to continue to keep you excited about whatever Bowman University or Topps Chrome, Bowman Chrome, whatever releases they're coming out with, that rookie class, you name it. And two, they need to try to make more people come in. And they want those people to come in buying the new product. Because if they invite those new people in and those new people are only coming to buy Mickey Mantle cards, that does not generate revenue for them directly. Their answer? Get the athletes. Get the celebrities. Get a Comic-Con style South by Southwest fan fest. And I say to you, if the national is something that satisfies the collector, if it's something that's there for deals to be made, trades to be made, trade nights to happen, why can't we also have this fan fest? Why can't we also have the excitement of what's new and what's current? with the realization that at some point in time, the hope is that what's new and what's current becomes something that you want to collect, you want to buy, you want to trade. Think about that. Some of the biggest hits that came out of older cases at the National, somebody pulled a Mahomes NT RPA out of a 2017 National Treasures, the true RPA out of 99. That card came out in 2017. It's a Panini card, not Fanatics, Panini card. But at one point in time, that card was new. That card was a current release seven years ago. It's now in that bucket of people want to buy it, people want to trade it, people want that's a that's a card that the collectors want to own. Exquisite when it came out in 03, and then the multiple years that it came out after was a current card. They weren't selling for what they sell for now because interest has grown over time in those products. And think about when Shine pulls a Kobe LeBron dual auto. 
out of 10, number eight to 10, eight out of 10, the best one you can get because Kobe was wearing 24 that year. And I mean, eight, it's not the jersey number on the card, but it's damn close, right? When that card has a recent comp of $350,000, right? It wasn't selling for that when the product came out. But all the things that have happened in the hobby, from the Gary V's to the Jeff Wilson's to the sports card radios to whoever else you want to throw in there, the hobby has grown. More people are here. More people came back in for nostalgia reasons, you name it. That all adds to the value of that side of the line. The people who wanted to buy that exquisite card, the people who wanted the Michael Jordan cards, the Cajun hierarchy of the Jordan cards. You go back seven years, you could buy all of those cards for a lot less money than they sell for now. So what changed? What changed was what was current was being built up. What changed was more people have come in. And when more people come in, there's more people to chase those cards that were current at one point, but are now moving into this other bucket of national items, collector's items, the PMGs, the exquisites, the rubies, the national treasures RPAs of Patrick Mahomes, the cards that PSA might switch over from a Beckett label to a PSA label, the cards that are the talk of the national, the cards that everybody's looking for and trading for. Sure, vintage takes a little while to get there, the baseball stuff, but heck, I'm seeing a lot of increases in prices in those 80s tops cards. You know, your Tiffany Bonds and your, you know, your 83 Gwyns are selling for more money. Those were all current cards at one point in time. And I guess what I'm trying to say is what Fanatics is attempting to do with this other parallel path, of course it's self-serving, okay? Of course it is. They need to generate revenue. And the way for them to generate revenue is to leverage their relationships with athletes and leagues, who are also, by the way, getting paid if they do well, to bring more people, more eyeballs to the current products. And the hope is that if we're okay with both, that by them bringing attention to these current products, maybe I want to bring my kid to Fanatics Fest. Maybe you want to bring your kid to Fanatics Fest. Maybe your neighbor hears about it on AM radio. You're a card guy. They say to you, hey, you're going to this Fanatics Fest? Maybe, maybe I'll go with you. And maybe their initial exposure is to that current card. But if they stay, and I'm not saying everybody will, but if they stay, maybe they or someone who enjoys Fanatics Fest, but also attends a national one day and is a potential trading partner for you on one of those cards. Maybe they start to fall in love with Patrick Mahomes and want to trade or buy up to an NTRPA one day. Maybe someone who comes in on this side of the bright line demarcation stays long enough to see themselves move over to the other side. That I believe is what's happening here and why having both is a good thing because they can feed off of each other. And while obviously Fanatics currently is concerned about generating revenue and producing cards that they can sell now, what's wrong with that? If they produce a good product, if they produce a good event, the hope is an overflow effect. The hope is that people who enjoy that Use that as their entry, their gateway drug, if you will, to the hobby. And then you guys who are here on the other side of the line who just enjoyed national. And I'm not just talking about the crusty guys with their 52 tops cards and their old pre-war vintage. I'm talking about the 90s basketball guys too. Think about that for a second. At one point in time, your cards were current cards also. It was during a boom. It was during you know a crazy cycle in the 90s as well. But for a while, nothing happened. And then you had a whole bunch more interest in these cards. And all of a sudden, they're all worth a lot more. Well, if Fanatics does it right, and we're not all shitting on what they're doing, but if Fanatics does it right, and they bring people to the space, doesn't it follow that some of those people will stay and maybe become a Michael Jordan collector? And maybe it's one, two, or dozens more people who are chasing that Jordan hierarchy, which then makes your tier one Jordans all the more valuable. 
if there's more people chasing that fewer amount of cards, it doesn't mean you have to go out and buy other cards. It doesn't mean you have to go and break. I've talked about breakers for a while. I've talked about top, last week did a whole episode on tops. Man, a lot of people commented on it. I just do what I do because that commentary was really, I think tops can do better. And if we shine a light on some of the stuff that they're not doing well, maybe they will notice it and do better next time. It's not negativity, and anybody who reads this episode as negative, you got to go back and play it again, because I'm being as positive as I can be here, and the positive take, I will call it a realistic take, is we can have both. They will feed each other, but I think if the Fanatics Fest is run the right way, not only will they generate revenue for themselves because they'll be able to sell their products, they'll be able to hopefully, you know, take this up. It will help everyone else who's in that national category, that collector category. Why? Because there are going to be some things they do that people love, and they're going to expect to see it at national next year. It's kind of that mint effect, right? When you have the mint collective and all of a sudden, wow, carpeting and signs and Look at the professionalism that we brought in. Boom. The corporate area starts to look better at the national. I'm sure there will be some takeaways from the Fanatics Fest that will find their way into national next year. That alone is worth cheering for Fanatics Fest. But the more important part, why you should want them to succeed, is because it's all part of the same ecosystem. Traveling on parallel paths, sure. But if they succeed, it just means... Better cards now that hopefully become the cards people want to chase in time. But more importantly, not only do the cards move over that bright line demarcation, the people do as well. And it's a good thing for us to have more people in the hobby. Good thing for me, it's more people watching this. Good thing for you, if you're a breaker, it's more people coming in and breaking your product. It's more people for you to sell to. Good thing for tops. Good thing for fanatics. It's revenue being generated. It's positive talk. And, and, and over time, it's a good thing for you collectors as well who are sitting there with your cards because it will translate over. There will be more people, which means more demand for your limited supply. And that's a good thing. It's not something we should be crapping on. And that's my take of why we should want to have both. Now, I don't know what the Fanatics Fest is going to be like. I have no idea. All right? I saw some really cool stuff happen at the National. A lot of cool deals. A lot of cool cards being graded. I anxiously await Nat Turner's, you know, top cards that came through PSA for grading. We'll see that. I will tell you um, I'm already paying attention to uh, Chicago airfare and Chicago hotels because I did not enjoy sitting here. Eh, maybe I did. Um, cause I have a pool, but so maybe I did enjoy myself a little bit, but I did not like missing out. I did not like not being there. Um, I did not like that. There were a lot of people like shit, you know, I would have loved to hang out with you. I would have loved to grab a drink, you know, smoke a cigar. Um, you know, anybody who's seen me at the last four nationals, you know, or the mint collectives or any of the events, you know, I just, I'll stand outside, smoke a cigar and chat. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I have fun at these events. It's, it's about the people. But when you, when you say that it's about the people, think about this for a second. If the national is about the people, right, and it's about the relationships that you're building, and it's about the camaraderie between hobby folks, well, then shouldn't we also want to support Fanatics Fest? Because the goal there is to bring more people in. And if they bring more people in, eventually some of those people are going to be the ones you want to meet at the national. They're going to be people who stay. They're going to be people who become collectors. They're going to be people who you might make a deal with at the national two, three, or four years from now. So let's hope they both succeed. And there's my spiel for today, guys. Thanks, Skybox, for the hat. Send me a hat. I'll wear it for a show. Talk to you guys soon. Take care, everybody.